You remember how exciting it was when you were a kid? When you'd find out that a new game that you were really looking forward to was coming out? I don't think I could ever forget how hyped I was the day that I saw this. The year was 1997. Nintendo had just brought out the most powerful game console the industry had ever seen. And I just found out that one of my favorite Super NES games, the game that had made me a Mario fan, was getting a direct sequel on the Nintendo 64. It seemed like such a no-brainer! Super Mario RPG 2! And then I looked past the title and saw what this game actually looked like. Huh, that didn't seem like what I was expecting. In fact, it didn't look like what anybody expected out of an N64 game. After so many decades of games being locked to two dimensions, true 3D was finally possible. And it was just taken as given that this was what games were going to look like from now on. Anything else would be anachronistic. It took a generation or two for the industry to realize that a game like this still had value. That three dimensions didn't make for inherently better games than two dimensions. But in 1997, a cartoony 2D Mario sprite wasn't retro, it was just old. And I don't think game critics of the time really knew what to make of it. Mostly, they seemed to take the game's visuals as being indicative of its target audience. This looks like a silly cartoon because it's for kids! And hey, that's fair, Miyamoto said as much. I was a kid at the time, and while I do remember being a bit let down that it looked so different, I was open-minded about it. I mean, come on, who cares what it looks like? It's still a sequel to one of my favorite games. Oh, I couldn't wait to play it. But I would have to wait. I would have to wait for what seemed like a very, very long time. Josh Wallen on the Josh and Kaylin Show. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that, Kaylin? The By the time this game that I'd been looking forward to since I was nine years old was actually finished, was actually in my hands, my voice had changed. I said get out of here! What's wrong with you? Paper Mario, a game that by all appearances was targeted at kids, was released right when I was on the cusp of no longer being one. Right as I hit that awkward age where you're a little too desperate to prove that you're not a kid anymore. These colorful cartoon graphics, these corny character designs, this irreverent, infantile tone. This wasn't the world I knew. These weren't the characters I'd loved. This was not the game I had been looking forward to for all those years. Nintendo had lied to me. This was not Super Mario RPG 2. When I was 13, I didn't judge Paper Mario for what it was. I dismissed it for what it wasn't. But when I was 13, I was an idiot! And it's time to find out just how big of an idiot. Was I right to overlook this game for failing to live up to my personal childhood memories of an entirely different game? Or was I just being a hard-headed, nostalgia-blind, juvenile jackass? It's time to take off the rose-tinted glasses, forgive the lack of Gino, and finally, FINALLY, see Paper Mario for what it is instead of what I wanted it to be. And the reason I have this opportunity is because... This episode of the Geek Critique is sponsored by... You guys. Back TGC at patreon.com slash geekcritique to get early access to videos, hang out with me in an exclusive Discord chat, and get behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to all my supporters. I literally couldn't do any of this without you. All right, let's get critiquing! The Sega Saturn, Sony PlayStation, and Nintendo 64 represented a paradigm shift. More than any era I've yet experienced, the advent of polygonal 3D visuals fundamentally changed what video games were. And it took a while for the industry to figure out how things should work in this new paradigm. Viewed through a modern lens, the aesthetic of early 3D titles may look awfully barren. Something like this lacks a lot of the visual identity of its previous-gen counterpart. but. That's because three-dimensional was its visual identity. Nobody had ever seen a game look like this, and given how radically the third dimension changed how they played, you didn't really need much more. With a handful of exceptions, the visual styles available to this era could be defined almost entirely as either cartoony or, uh, realistic. That's why Paper Mario looking like it did cause such a stir in 97. The first thing we knew about Paper Mario is, appropriately, the first thing you notice. A visual style so unique they named the game after it. But this is anything but a throwback. Paper Mario evokes the style of a pop-up book come to life. N64 games would often use 2D sprites for objects, collectibles, or decoration. It's why these trees always face the camera. 
but Paper Mario flips the script, rendering the environment in 3D, but building all of its characters out of super expressive 2D sprites. Despite the critics of the time, and me at 13, who were all up our own butts about this game looking too cutesy for our very mature tastes, Paper Mario's stylized visuals have helped it stand the test of time a whole lot better than most of its contemporaries. I mean, how many sequels to N64 games are still trying to evoke such a similar style? Despite the visuals, though, the structure of individual areas tends to be very much in the same vein as Mario RPG. Blocky 3D geometry that looks like it was carved straight out of the ground, floating on a 2D background. And if there is one thing that Team Josh got completely wrong about this game, that might be it. There is so much more Mario RPG in here than I ever gave it credit for. The overarching story is the same in broad strokes. The game opens with a one-on-one -on -one fight against Bowser, Mario gets flung out of the castle, we see a long fall from a wide shot, cue the logo. Mario learns that his rival has broken the ability for witches to come true, and seeks the power of seven stars to restore it. In Japan, the connection's even more obvious, as Paper Mario's Shooting Star Summit keeps its original name, Star Hill. Not that the connection wasn't obvious anyway, look at those stars jutting out of the ground. I haven't even scratched the surface. A karate dojo, a toad composer, a forest maze, a lone rodent in the middle of a desert. It's so close at times, it gave me a strange sense of nostalgia for a game I'd never actually played much of before. The aesthetic might be different, but this absolutely is a spiritual successor to Super Mario RPG. I might even go so far as to call it a spiritual remake. But don't get it twisted, it's only in spirit. Because as fun and surprising as these homages are, there's a very good reason they changed the name. Team Josh might have been an idiot, but he was right about one thing. Paper Mario is not Super Mario RPG 2. While Square's take on a Mario RPG might have been a little more streamlined, a little more accessible, a little more Mario than their usual fare, it was still cast from the same mold, the same principles, the same standards. It was a Squaresoft RPG, why wouldn't it be? But of course, well... Let's just say that by 97, Square and Nintendo weren't exactly on speaking terms. The sequel would have to be developed by someone else. The prospect of following up a Square game without Square must have been daunting. If you can't be better than, you're going to be less than by default. Unless you do something to be different. If the previous game was trying to marry Mario's platforming roots with the conventions of an RPG, then Paper Mario is a game determined to break from convention. Most traditional JRPGs have their roots in tabletop games, where complex mathematical values get fed through random dice rolls to dictate what a character can do and how effective they are. Of course, you don't need to know what these numbers mean to have a good time with Pokémon, but it's still the backbone of the game's systems. But Paper Mario is a game where this is your stat screen. Defeating enemies gets you star points. Collect 100 star points, the counter resets, and Mario, and only Mario, levels up. But you gain points on a curve. Strong enemies relative to you will get you more. Weaker enemies eventually stop being worth the effort, and if you're too far ahead, they're not worth anything. Since there are no random encounters, this effectively eliminates even the pretense of grinding. When Mario levels up, you can choose to increase one of these three numbers. HP is your health, FP powers your attacks, and BP... Uh, BP is something else entirely. Let's put a pin in it. But leveling up makes absolutely no difference in how much damage you can dish out, or how hard enemies hit. Attack and defense stats do still exist, but instead of scaling with your level, they get buffed by your equipment. And when I say equipment, I just mean Mario's shoes and Mario's hammer. That's it. That's all there is. No polka dresses or work shirts or lazy shells or tub rings. What I'm saying is that equipment isn't something you can customize. You won't get to a new area and need to swap out your old gear for better stuff. That's one of those conventions we've left behind. Mario just finds better upgrades at specific points over the course of the adventure, and they apply automatically. And while Mario might amass a sizable squad of allies, these don't work anything like traditional RPG party members. Instead, the game calls them partners. Only one of them can fight alongside Mario at a time, but they can be swapped during battle. They don't have hit points, but they can still be hit, and will have to set out a few turns if they are. They don't level up with Mario. Instead, they're powered up by super blocks that you find by exploring the overworld. And each partner has distinct abilities and attacks unique to them. Unique both in terms of abilities, and as it turns out, in terms of controls. The timed hits battle system that I loved so much has been renovated and improved to the point that honestly, the original game kind of looks basic in comparison. What used to be timed hits are now known as action commands, and that distinction is important. Different moves now rely on unique control methods. 
Jumps are still all about timing the A button, but the hammer has you pull back and charge your swing on the control stick. Defense timing is still present too, and it feels completely different than the Super Nintendo game. Man, 24 years of muscle memory is awfully hard to unlearn. All of this makes Paper Mario an aggressively non-traditional example of its genre. It's not a square RPG in the shape of a Mario game, it's a Mario game in the shape of an RPG. Hmm. Okay, let me explain. A classic Mario game builds its challenges around specific stage hazards. These are always introduced fairly safely, but once a player has a chance to understand how they work, they're iterated on, made more dangerous or numerous, mixed and matched with other hazards and platforms and challenges, and that challenge builds and builds and builds until you overcome some sort of an ultimate crescendo, and then the game moves on to something else. This is critical to Mario's progression, to the momentum of the adventure. Once the level designers have mined the best challenges they can from the concept, and a player has proved their mettle, we don't linger. Mario never lets a good idea overstay its welcome. It keeps moving forward. Paper Mario might not be a platformer, but it's built from that same blueprint. Let's use bob bombs as an example. They're only capable of hitting you with this dinky little attack, but as soon as you attack them, the fuse is lit. And now, if you hit him again, they explode. And if you don't hit him again, then as soon as it's their turn, they're gonna explode anyway. So the optimal strategy the game teaches you with bob bombs is to not hit them until you're in a position to take them out on the same turn. Then you can light them up with any attack, but you've got to deal the last blow with a ranged attack. Or just make Goombario blow himself up. I mean, what's he gonna do? The bob bomb concept is introduced, iterated upon, mixed and matched with all the other enemy types, which of course also all have their own unique properties. Then, before any of this can overstay its welcome, it's all discarded, and the game moves on to something new. Koopa Troopas have high defense until you knock them over with a jump. Flying enemies can't be hammered. Spiked enemies can only be hammered. Powerful hyper attacks need to be dodged. And it just keeps going learning the ins and outs of what your foes can do, and the quickest, most efficient way of overcoming them is the name of the game. Experience points don't dictate how effective you are, your literal experience does. This strategy effectively translates the formula of a traditional Mario platformer into a turn-based combat system. It's built around unique mechanics and obstacles, it teaches you through gameplay, it's simple to understand, but it's got a surprising amount of hidden depth and uncovering that depth is something that happens naturally through the game design. Which is not to say that it's always easy. The most pleasant surprise I had with this game was how, like, unabashedly challenging it is. Paper Mario features unabashed, unapologetic game overs, and when you get one, there's no option to continue from a checkpoint. There's no way to continue at all. You're just booted all the way back to the title screen, and you have to restart from wherever you happen to last save the game. While I do understand why some would call this outdated, at this point I think it's refreshing. It seems like more and more, failure in games comes with no real consequences. So afraid are developers of alienating a player. And if that's what the developer is going for, I'm totally fine with it. Not every game needs this sort of thing. But real game overs are becoming a lost art and Paper Mario makes for a compelling argument for what we might be losing. Take the situation I'm in right here. I'm on the ropes. If I knew I could just restart from a checkpoint, I might not care so much. Because if I fail or even throw the fight, I could just respawn like nothing happened, use a few healing items, and walk right through this. But here, I have to focus. I have to plan my tactics well. I have to try. If I fail this action command, fail to defend, if I fail, I've lost a lot more than just one fight. I've lost all the progress I've made through this dungeon. This completely changes the tension of the game, how invested I am in it, and what I'm willing to risk to stay in the fight. A pretty common issue in a lot of games is that players will stockpile good items, trying to save them for when they need them, and wind up just never using them. But in Paper Mario, I was incentivized to use these incredibly powerful, incredibly useful items because of scenarios like this. Pushing that further is yet another break from your usual RPGs. You can only hold 10 items at once, and duplicates don't stack. But you can only pull that tension for so long. Like its predecessor, Paper Mario is an RPG where a great deal of actual gameplay happens outside the boundaries of turn-based combat. Overworld movement is right in line with what you'd expect from a first-party N64 game. That is to say, it's nice and responsive, but Mario moves a step or two slower than you'd really prefer. Fortunately, the Z button causes him to... with a burst of speed. This move is called Mario's... Spin Dash. Okay, who do you think you're fooling? But unlike a real spin dash, your momentum doesn't carry into a jump, so you wind up moving around like this most of the time. Like I said, standard N64 era stuff here. 
you're a little too slow, but you can tap a button to get a burst of speed. This is a notable break from one of my favorite things about Mario RPG. That game's overworld movement was replicating the speedy precision of a platformer. Now Paper Mario's the one that's basic in comparison. It works perfectly well for what it is, but I would have appreciated if Paper Mario could move more like Mario Mario did in 64. I'm not saying I think the game should have been more focused on platforming challenges by any means, just that I'd have preferred if gameplay in the overworld had felt more like a platformer. But how about that overworld? Where the previous game split its locales into a map screen, Paper Mario's world is interconnected. In less capable hands, this could make progression a chore. When the game expected me to hike all the way back to Toad Town after the second chapter, I was worried it might. But unlike Mario RPG, Paper Mario's progression isn't linear. Toad Town encompasses the bulk of the game's shops and side quests. Every area of the game branches off from here. And that's fantastic. It means Toad Town winds up serving the same branching hub function that Peach's Castle did. I think one reason I have trouble sticking with RPGs stems from the fact that if I go a few days, or a few weeks, or a few months without playing one, it's easy to come back and have no idea where I was. But Toad Town features a fortune teller, complete with an industry standard disco ball, who will give you a hint about what to do next. This carries the dual benefit of ensuring you don't lose your place, and pointing lost players in the right direction. It's nice. Hi, Future Josh here. I'm editing the episode now, and I'm kind of realizing that, like, people are gonna wonder why the footage quality keeps changing. Uh, it's because I was trying out different ways to play early on. I started out emulating the game on Dolphin, but I was worried I'd have to edit out too much stuttering. So then I switched to the N64 version for a bit, but ultimately decided it was just too low resolution and muddy. So I finally decided to go with the Wii Virtual Console version, which does have a handful of small issues, but it was sort of the best trade-off between consistency and quality. So yeah, alright, now you know. It doesn't take long for a loop to emerge. The story is split into eight chapters, and they're surprisingly episodic. Mario learns where a star spirit might be held, sets off from Toad Town in that direction, overcomes obstacles, meets new characters, adds new partners, fights new enemies, and finds new abilities. He ultimately uncovers a dungeon of some kind, engages in a stronghold showdown against the chapter's boss, rescues a star spirit, and hits the end of chapter. Then it's time to backtrack to Toad Town and figure out where to go next. It's a testament to how well designed the game is and how much variety it has that this does not feel repetitive. Just like the battle system, each chapter is built on a steady stream of fresh, fun gameplay ideas that are introduced, explored, and discarded. Never, well, rarely letting anything overstay its welcome. And while the way forward may always be fairly clear, progression is structured, not rigid. There are quite a few optional side quests and areas that can be targeted at your leisure. In fact, one memorable play session saw me set off in one direction, get a game over and lose that progress, then choose a completely different direction and find a bunch of totally different stuff to do. Paper Mario is generally a much slower game than its predecessor. Movement is slower, battles are slower, the world is much larger, and the time you spend in any one area is much higher. But calling it slower makes it sound like a negative. Maybe it's more accurate to say it takes its time more. Its pacing is slower, but it does more with it. More variety in areas, more strategy in battles, more puzzles, more enemies, and most impressively, more cohesion. In the last game, you remember this, I jumped on an enemy and went, what? Overworld traversal was entirely walled off. It was a separate system from turn-based combat. But in Paper Mario, if you jump on an enemy, how you enter battles actually matters. This is genius in its simplicity, integrating Mario's platforming roots into RPG combat. Oh, and enemies can also get the first strike. Look, if this was as deep as the game got, I still think Paper Mario would be a perfectly charming, enjoyable, and unique experience, but it would run the risk of being perhaps too streamlined. Every battle would be predicated on the same relatively small pool of actions, which would get stronger through upgrades, and which would expand through partners, but the player wouldn't have a whole lot of choice. Paper Mario would have little in the way of variability, customization, or replayability, and these are areas where traditional RPGs tend to thrive. But how do you do that without overcomplicating the system or overwhelming the player? For the answer, let's unpin this and... See, it was a badge. It was a badge! <laughs> I'm very clever. BP stands for Badge Points. The more BP you have, the more badges you can equip. And individual badges cost different amounts to equip, depending on how powerful or useful they are. The game itself makes no distinction between different types of badges, but for the sake of the critique, I will. Active badges give Mario additional special moves. For instance, your hammer can normally only hit the frontline enemy on the ground, 
but the hammer throw badge lets you slam them down from anywhere. Give your jump status effects. Hit every enemy on screen with a quake. Use multiple items in one turn. Time your hits to jump on enemies in sequence. You don't learn new moves from level ups in this game, you equip them through badges. And because of that, the scope of what you can do in battle is always increasing. Passive badges affect Mario's stats, or otherwise change his attributes. This is where smart customization comes into play. I got wiped against this fiery piranha plant, but with a fire shield and ice power badge, I turned things around. Normally, if you want to switch partners mid-battle, that takes up a turn. But there's a borderline OP badge that lets you do it for free. You can make enemies drop more items on defeat, ease up the timing on action commands, or even make it so attacks will sometimes just miss completely if Mario's at low health. And as much as I love timed hits, the all or nothing badge was one of my favorites. If you time the action command right, you do more damage. But if you miss it, you do no damage. It's high reward, high risk. Field badges affect gameplay outside of battle. The first attack badge makes it so that if you stomp a weak enemy in the field, you'll just skip combat entirely. This only works on enemies that wouldn't give you any star points anyway, but the level curve scales fast enough that for all intents and purposes, it'll work most of the time when you need to backtrack. But if there's one badge that really impressed upon me how brilliant this system was, it's Speedy Spin. Mario's spin dash goes faster and further, and by combining this with first attack, BOOM! Traversal is more fun, the overworld movement doesn't bother me half as much, and backtracking isn't a chore because you can move faster! Yeah, I know, bottoms up. There's a badge shop in Toad Town that rotates out a small selection of badges, but most of them are found in the overworld. Given how useful they are, you have a real incentive to search out every nook and cranny and invest in the world, because the things you find are actually worth it. It's just perfect how this system operates. You don't need to know math, it's so freaking simple that a seven-year-old could understand it, and I know that because my friend who sold me this cart was seven when he played it. Yet despite the simplicity, badges add so much depth, so much strategy, so much variety, and so much fun. The badge system really just makes Paper Mario. Creative cohesion is all over the game design. The star pieces that Mario needs to restore people's wishes aren't just colorful MacGuffins to collect, they're characters in their own right, and every time you rescue one, you gain access to new in-battle abilities driven by more star power. Partners, meanwhile, aren't just party members, they aren't just useful in battle, each one also comes with a gameplay function in the overworld. But while they may be more integral to gameplay, the story itself isn't really character-driven. Not even to the same degree that Mario RPG was. Like, nobody really has an arc the way that Mallow did. Partners do come with plenty of flavor. Bonnet is a ditzy hothead. Bo is a pushy trickster. Like Lester starts out as an enemy and even gets his own battle theme. But they wind up having very little plot significance outside of their initial introductions. Only Goombario really continues to get much in the way of dialogue, and that's purely because of his utterly brilliant tattle ability. In battle, it gives you well-written and often hilarious information about enemy weaknesses, and lets you permanently see how much HP that enemy type has left. It's a big improvement on Mallow's psychopath. Outside of battle, they wrote unique dialogue for like every room in the game, it's crazy. But partners don't interact with each other, they almost never appear on screen together, and so they end up feeling more like game mechanics than characters in a story. But I don't say that to disparage Paper Mario. It's a different kind of game, and it works for what it's going for. It's just a little less character-driven, and a lot more situation-driven. In fact, it occasionally goes upwards of half an hour with no battles whatsoever. There are intermissions between each chapter where the story cuts to the castle, and you actually play as Peach. The goal here is usually reconnaissance. Peach needs to figure out where a star spirit is held so that she can relay that information to Mario. As a story concept, I love this. Peach might have gone back to spending the whole game kidnapped, but playing as her allows her to retain the agency she had in Mario RPG. Gameplay-wise, the whole system is turned on its head. Peach has no combat, no access to items, no equipment, but it was always a sequence I looked forward to, because it was always different enough to be refreshing. Sometimes you'll be sneaking among guards in light stealth sections, or even disguising yourself as enemies to evade them. But other intermissions see Peach baking a cake for a giant shy guy, or answering trivia questions on a game show. At one point, Paper Mario subverts your expectations entirely, as she just walks in on a conversation that tells her exactly what she needs to know after about 10 seconds of gameplay. As with Mario RPG, Bowser is one of the biggest highlights here, managing to come across as both a threat to be taken seriously, and a really endearing blowhard. I laughed out loud when I found his diary. 
Luigi at least shows up before the credits this time, but he spends the whole game holding the fort, and his frustration at being left out of yet another adventure was hilarious. It's an interesting take on the character. Later that year, Luigi's Mansion would codify him as more of a shuddering scaredy cat than a passive-aggressive misfit. In an era when a lot of games still struggled with localization, the dialogue throughout Paper Mario is charming, well-written, witty, and genuine. And genuine's a good word. In its tone, Paper Mario is earnest. It's cozy and familiar. It still carries that sense of whimsy, but like a lot of fairy tales, there's always just something a little bit... off about it. A little warped. A little demented. You'll be exploring around this sweet little penguin village, watching the snow fall and enjoying the jolly music, and then... A cartoon penguin with X's in his eyes shouldn't be unnerving, but it hits that way because of how unexpected it is, and how well the game sets up the context. This turns into a whodunit story where Mario has to prove he wasn't the one who did it! And, uh, don't worry, Mayor Penguin wasn't really dead. A bit later, I'm exploring the snowy mountain area. Huh, look at that! The first Mario game on this platform had a mirror room, and so too will the last. It all comes around! Shut up, that doesn't count. Ooh, and the mirror effect persists inside the palace too! And in this room, and in this room, and just when you're starting to think it's overstaying its welcome... What? You can walk behind it! You can go back! You can even go outside! The entire palace is split into two... dimensions, almost! What you do on one side of the mirror affects things on the other side, meaning that what was just a cool effect is now the central gimmick of the entire palace. Another sequence sees Mario exploring a haunted mansion, with absolutely nothing to fight. It's pure puzzle solving backed by strong thematic elements, and it works so well. And... Oh my god, you guys. That's... That's the old Mario design in a game that's not as old! Well, you know the rules, I've gotta go talk about Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles and pro wrestling for some reason. Yet another enormous conversational tangent brought to you by the Geek Critique. There's a reason I named it that. Often a new area will give you some kind of obtuse sequence where it's not entirely clear exactly what you're supposed to do. And yet, it's not frustrating. You get to spend a bunch of time exploring the world, talking to the characters, enjoying the themes and getting invested. It manages to be a ton of fun to just kind of hang out in this game. And if I replay it, that obtuseness won't get in the way, because I'll come in knowing what to do. While you can't skip story scenes entirely, you can fast-forward dialogue by holding down the B button. Man, I wish more RPGs did stuff like that, it's gonna make this thing so much more replayable. And, uh, I just wanna cut in one more time here. Editing this episode actually made me miss the game, and I've actually started replaying it again. So there you go. But my favorite chapter in the whole game, and a slice of everything that makes Paper Mario great, is Chapter 5, Hot Hot Times on Lava Lava Island. The chapter starts with Mario and Pals making the acquaintance of a professor named Colorado, who serves as a story companion throughout the chapter. He's a brilliant archaeologist, a daring explorer, and a seeker of lost artifacts. Or so he says. You also meet a whale named... Whale? He'd love to ferry you to Lava Lava Island, but he's got a stomach ache. So you... Huh. Yeah, the N64 sure did feature some bizarre recurring elements across its library. On the ride over, I remember thinking, Huh, those birds look familiar. Where have I seen those before? What?! The whole chapter is a love letter to Yoshi's Island. And how perfect is that?! That game's hand-drawn aesthetic translates perfectly to Paper Mario's pop-up book come to life. Come to think of it, I think Paper Mario was seeding this from the beginning. There are little elements of every Mario game sprinkled in here, but it's got Yoshi's Island down to the core. By the power of one of those intentionally obtuse, hanging out in the village, getting to know the people sequences, we learn three things. Number one, they're teasing Raphael the Raven. He is probably going to be in this chapter, so that's exciting. Number two, there's no way to get into the volcano, and the star spirit is in the volcano, so that's gonna be a problem. Number three, when Mario was a baby, the Yoshis rescued him. Now the baby Yoshis are lost in the jungle, and Mario has to return the favor. Incredible. History often rhymes. So you make your way through the wilds, pushing through the underbrush to save those kids. Their babysitter even joins the party. You fight those squibs, save those kids, and discover a statue of Raphael the Raven with a space for some sort of artifact. No, past Josh, that's not gonna work. You dumbass.
the village elder repays you for your act of kindness by giving you a jade raven. And I wonder where that could go. This opens the way to the man himself, and... You know, it says a lot about how incredibly strong the boss design was in Yoshi's Island, that I'm even this excited about it. Like, I recognize this is an excellent game, but it never really gelled with me the way that it did with some players. I haven't even played all the way through it probably since the 90s, but I still remember how creative and awesome this boss was. Raphael enlists his ravens to help you get into the volcano. He also gives you something called the Ultra Stone. Like... Available for your home in 1995, only on Nintendo Ultra 64. Man, that name was awesome. I wish they'd stuck with it. Throughout the game, you've been able to upgrade one of your partners whenever you found a super block, giving them more abilities and, once again, giving you great incentive to think outside the box and explore. Well, with the power of the Ultra Stone, you can upgrade them all a second time, complete with an expanded set of abilities. Like, I had no idea I was even gonna get to do this. That's so cool! The volcano is just this long, grueling challenge. This is a showcase for character lighting, another subtle thing the game evokes to strike a mood, even with its cartoony, paper-thin aesthetic. Colorado accompanies you throughout the volcano, and by now you've learned. His bravery is more recklessness, his drive for treasure is a dangerous obsession, and his brilliance is only in his vocabulary. He starts out looking like an homage to Indiana Jones, but turns out to be more of a parody. Yet no matter how many times he gets into trouble, his dialogue and personality are so much fun and the game is so well written, he never wears out his welcome. At the heart of the volcano, you find the chapter boss, the Lava Piranha. It's no Mega Smilex, but it'll do. It put up a fight, but with the badge of brilliance I mentioned earlier, I took him down. This led into a volcanic escape sequence. You know how much I love those. Ah, uh, maybe the stakes aren't as high as the game wants me to think they are. Chapter 5 is Paper Mario at its most creative, its most reverential, its wittiest, its funniest, its very best. It's a slice of everything great about this game. And it's for reasons like this that I spent the majority of my time with Paper Mario, kinda kicking myself for being too headstrong and hard-headed to appreciate it 20 years ago. But hold on. I just said I spent the majority of my time feeling that way, but... 75% is a majority. For that other quarter of its runtime, Paper Mario feels markedly different. Anime fans will be familiar with the concept of filler. You see, an anime series cannot overtake the manga it's adapting, so it has to slow things down. Way down. While the good filler art can be fun, it often comes across more like it's wasting time rather than just filling it. Poorly executed filler kills tension. It's why five minutes on Planet Namek lasts seven episodes. Filler is often a necessity in the medium, but it's an unfortunate one. I bring all this up to draw a contrast. Chapter 5 took me from Toad Town, across the sea, into a Yoshi village, through a jungle, and into a volcano. It was overflowing with unique set pieces, fun challenges, interesting characters, and some of the best music in the game. So let's contrast that with Chapter 4. It's made up of four identical areas, numerous, repetitive, easy enemy encounters, and the most grating song in the game. You don't even leave Toad Town to get there. You just find a toy box and hop in. But man, if you want to talk about spinning your wheels. I hate to do this to you, Paper Mario. I really do, but... You go into the toy box, fight a bunch of shy guys, get a storeroom key, go back to Toad Town, go to the shop, use the key, get a toy train, throw it into the toy box, take the train, fight a bunch of shy guys, get a frying pan, go back to Toad Town, get the chef to make a cake, go back to the toy box, fight a bunch of shy guys, give this cake to Gourmet Guy for a sequence that's actually really funny, but oh my god, come on! And with him gone, you take the train again, fight a bunch of shy guys, find a dictionary, take it back to Toad Town to learn the order you've gotta hit these boxes in, or just hit him yourself and get lucky, take the train one more time, fight a bunch of shy guys, meet a new partner, fight a bunch of shy guys, then finally, you find a boss and the boss is great, but at this point I've gone back and forth and back and forth so many times and I'm just so sick of fighting so many shy guys. <sighs> Video games don't need filler. I wish the modern AAA industry would learn that. Whew, that's not even the only offender. A few chapters later we get flower fields. Now this one starts out kind of cool. Throughout the whole game, I had been finding these magical seeds from the bulbs in the overworld. A gardener in Toad Town will plant them, and so I spent the whole game assuming this was an optional side quest. But in fact, planting them all opens a secret door to the fields. 
And like, that's really neat. Something that looks like a side quest turning out to be something a lot more important. Once Mario's in there, a giant talking tree tells him he needs to grow a giant beanstalk. And to do that, he'll need beans, soil, and water. The theming here is unnerving, full of these odd, sad plant people who lament their own inability to move. The area is sort of like Final Fantasy VII's Wall Market, an objective-driven dungeon where you talk to the right people to get what you need, but it's just not structured very well. The central hub branches off in six directions. Each one leads to one particular character, and none of them are signposted well enough that you can really keep them straight. I guess it's more interesting than Shy Guy's toy box, but it feels even more tedious. Especially because, for some reason, this part of the game where you have to do so much crisscrossing and backtracking is also the one time in the whole game where enemies respawn every time you leave the screen they're on. Again, at least the boss of the area was a blast, and actually he really turned the battle system on its head. Nonetheless, I think it's telling that my aforementioned buddy who played this when he was a kid put 27 hours into Paper Mario, but never made it out of filler fields. For the most part, Paper Mario manages to be either better than, or more often, different than Mario RPG. But if there's one area where Paper Mario just can't compare to its spiritual predecessor, it's the music. And like, this was inevitable. I don't even like most RPGs, and even I know it's almost impossible to beat Square at music. Now there are some really great compositions in here. Several songs seem to be built on motifs from earlier in the N64's life. I especially love the Shooting Star Summit theme. When the music is good, it's really good. But a lot of the time it's just a little... I don't know, understated? Repetitive? I like the music just fine. It gets the job done. But a little too often, it just gets the job done. Then again, I've never worked for IGN, so maybe my imagination just isn't good enough. Man, like, I have as much reverence for Miyamoto as the next guy, but NES kids were next level about it. Whew! As long as I'm making comparisons to Mario RPG, most of the minigames in Paper Mario also tend to be a little basic. Even the best stuff, like that cooking game or the quiz show, get their charm from dialogue and flavor text, not so much gameplay. That's how a lot of Paper Mario's Dawn Battle elements compare to its predecessor. As with the overworld movement, as with the music, the minigames here are perfectly serviceable, but there's nothing on the level of the Midas River course or the Moleville minecart ride. But let's not overstate things, whether I hold it up to Mario RPG or not. Whether I consider a few chapters to be a little fillery or not, Paper Mario is still a fantastic game. I can forgive myself for being a dumb edutine and holding it against my nostalgia when I first played it, but even when I got it on Virtual Console in 2007, I still only made it to Koopa Village. I mean, damn, that was the same time I got into Super Metroid, so you'd think I'd have seen the light by then. But maybe it's not just my own dumb fault. I'm gonna do something I've never done before and just quote my own notes here. Here's what I jotted down right after I finished the prologue. I can see why some would consider this to be an awfully slow start, but I think it's one of those games that eases you in, and there's a lot of depth to be found by taking your time and enjoying it. Although, would I really be incentivized to dig so deep and find things to enjoy about it if I wasn't thinking about all the cool things I could say in a video? Or would the slow start actually be a problem then? The slow start would be a problem then, yes. Paper Mario is a game that waits for it. It takes its time. It demands your investment and attention. The story beats in the prologue are fine. The dialogue is as charming as ever. But where Mario RPG kept its conflict a mystery while you learned its mechanics, Paper Mario frontloads every detail of its plot before you even get out of the prologue, and that really slows things down. It's probably a necessary evil in light of the episodic structure of the game, but Paper Mario tries to ease you in so carefully that it always lost me. Even worse, the gameplay at the beginning is so rote and basic and boring, not at all representative of what it's gonna be. Now sure, Mario RPG tossed you into the deep end, but even as an eight-year-old entirely unaccustomed to turn-based combat, I could get my head around it. It still had optional tutorials, it just trusted you to figure out the basics. Paper Mario is skewed way too far in the other direction. You don't even have action commands at first. This is by no means a game-breaker. 
The gameplay is exceptional once you get past the prologue, and it's only an hour or two of a 25 plus hour game. After that point, Paper Mario takes off the water wings and dunks you in that deep end, and that's appreciated. Like I said last time, Mario RPGs would not always live up to these ideals. But that's early in the game. Late in the game, I found that even the venerated battle system was feeling a little... rickety. For one thing, as much as I'll praise the Action Command system, there isn't always enough variety with them. I kept getting new partners and finding out, oh, okay, it's yet another one of those moves where you pull back on the control stick. It's still great, it just starts feeling a little repetitive. Early on, the usefulness of star power is balanced by how limited it is, how little you can do with it, and how slowly it charges. But every time Mario rescues another spirit, that meter increases. There are even badges that'll let you charge it faster. And late game abilities give you access to incredibly powerful moves that were formerly locked behind rare or expensive single-use items. And that's when the battles start feeling unbalanced in Mario's favor. The game gets kind of easy, even to the detriment of its creativity. The guardian of the final star spirit, the Crystal King, is an incredible boss, with a super fun gimmick that gets foreshadowed and built up throughout his palace. At first, I used my partners to buff Mario's attack, buff his defense, power him up! But I was still struggling, it was still a fight and I was having a blast! Then I noticed I could use the star power to just, just lock the Crystal King out of moving for three turns. That kind of took the wind out of my sails. But with all seven star spirits rescued, I'd have to climb Shooting Star Summit one more time to open the way forward. Paper Mario does a really exceptional job setting up ideas hours ahead of paying them off. From the beginning, in fact, the first thing you do when you take control is walk around the palace, meeting the citizens of the kingdom, teasing all the places you'll go and the people you'll meet. Much later, in one intermission, I had very nearly climbed to the top of the tower as Peach, only for Bowser to anticlimactically tear her away, stoking my determination to get Mario up there. And if you want to talk payoff, right before I climbed the summit, I decided to go back to Mario's house one more time, and discovered that the people I'd helped throughout the game had been sending letters, thanking Mario, letting him know how things were going, hoping he'd visit again, and wishing him luck. Wishing me luck. Man, this game is so cozy. Let's do it for them! Up into Star Haven, a town whose design makes it clear that you've moved beyond Mario's world and closer to Sanctuary. And speaking of which, when I made it onto this scene, I froze. This is the Sanctuary from the intro. Every single time I'd started the game up, I'd heard this song in the intro. I'd seen this place, and now I was finally here. Paper Mario sets it up and pays it off. The Star Spirits give Mario a holy celestial baby carriage starship thing, and he docks at Bowser's castle. For some reason, I guess through the repetition of seeing it so much, I'd kind of taken the fact that Peach's castle was being suspended by Bowser's as just, like, a cool visual. But nope, Mario has to fight his way up through the keep to even get there. Bowser's castle is a gauntlet, climbing higher and higher, pushing through creative puzzles, relying on all your partners, and fighting through hordes of the toughest enemies in the game. Some of it kind of reminds me of a place I've been before. Hmm. And right when I thought I'd hit the top, Paper Mario sets it up as the bosses of the very first chapter make a comeback. The Koopa Brothers! See, Mario RPG had the Axum Rangers, but Paper Mario reaches back before my time with these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle parodies. Oh, these guys are so much fun! And I guess they were talking to Gosei because they've got new powers! I can't wait to see what they... Paper Mario pays it off. This is Junior Troopa. He's been a recurring boss fight throughout the game. He's the personification of a tryhard, and yeah, sure, okay. He's also hilarious, but like, come on, I wanted to fight the Koopa Brothers! And the game had the confidence to know I'd want that. And now I'm gonna wipe the floor with this guy! Paper Mario began at Peach's Castle, and after everything I've been through, I'm finally back. It's time to climb this tower and save Peach once and for all. Once and for all. Yeah. Bowser claims he's got a way to multiply his power. Hold on, this seems familiar. Oh man, there's been so much Yoshi's Island in here and they wouldn't do that, would they? They wouldn't! Nope, they wouldn't. I'm gonna be honest, this last boss is quite an anti-climax. Every few turns, he uses the Star Rod to make himself invincible, so you'll use the power of the stars to strip him of that power. Then just keep hammering away. Trying to invoke a status effect didn't work. No particular strategy did anything. 
so I just kept attacking. He also heals a lot, and for a lot, which only serves to stretch it out even longer. And although by the end I was so low on items that I had to start getting a little clever, I still spent almost 20 minutes just wailing on him. After an entire game of interesting, creative, strategic boss designs, it's quite a letdown that the final one mostly just comes down to... well, spamming your numbers against his. But as good as the rest of the game's been, I guess it's not the biggest letdown. Especially when at least the narrative aspect of it works. And maybe that was more the point. There's a brief side battle where you play as Peach and her partner Twink, which cements Peach's active role in the narrative. It's been established that the stars get their power from people's wishes, and nobody's had more time to hope than she has. Her conviction ultra charges the star's power, which is what makes it possible to take down Bowser. There's some mumbo jumbo about how Bowser's lost power is creating a feedback loop into his castle, and... With that, we cut to a few days later. Paper Mario really is ending where it began, with a party at Peach's castle. Except this time, I know these characters, I know this world, and I am so happy I finally got to experience it. The end of the last episode focused on the positive aspects of nostalgia, but there's a very dark side to it too. Love without maturity yields passion without perspective. Fandoms turn toxic when too many people wield their preferences as a weapon to tear down everything that doesn't match it, and everyone who doesn't agree with it. And preferences, especially if it's a property where most fans become fans at a young age, tend to be heavily tied to what you grew up with. In the worst cases, this can create an echo chamber, as a subsect of fans reinforce the idea that whatever a series was when they were kids was correct and wonderful in the way it should be, and anything that moves away from that ideal is wrong and insulting and offensive to what the original creators intended. How dare something I loved as a child continue to appeal to children after I've stopped being one? When I first played Paper Mario back in 2001, that's exactly what I did. I was all passion, no perspective. I saw it only through the lens of what I wanted it to be, and I dismissed it for failing to live up to the impossible standard of my own childhood memories. I had a lot of growing up to do, and I'm glad I did. Looking at this game through that very same lens that once led me to dismiss it, now makes me realize just how much I'd been missing out on. In an almost bittersweet, ethereal way, I still feel that same spirit in Paper Mario. It'll never mean to me what Super Mario RPG did, but if I could have played it instead when I was eight, I can see that it absolutely would have. But Paper Mario is not Super Mario RPG, and that's exactly what makes it so special. It doesn't have to worry about getting out from under that game's shadow, because it is in a whole different dimension. Paper Mario is a break from tradition, a break from the formula, a break from expectations, and in 2001 there had never been a game like it. I was just a little too old and a little too young to see it that way.